Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk, where you get great news, great interviews, great interviewees, and sometimes a comedic touch. Before I bring on my guest today, make sure you hit the subscribe button, the like, and the notification bell so you get notified when these great interviews come about. Before further ado, I bring to you Mr. Ray Johnson. Ray Robertson, excuse me, how are you doing, Ray? I'm fine. Can you, you just call me Ray? Just call that's, me? Awesome. that's awesome. We were just talking about Ray J. Johnson Jr. You can call me Ray. Um, so today is the 30th day of October 1965, correct? I think you're a few years off. 58 years off, I think. Oh, right, right. Okay. Maybe I was in a maybe I was in a time warp there, Ray. So I've got Ray on the show today to talk about um one of the most influential bands from the late 60s, uh, 70s, and 80s, I believe, uh, the Great Full Dead. Now, um, Obviously, I'm a huge fan. I just have to ask Ray right off the top. top. When did the Grateful Dead first, um, the first ice cream cone come off the um, assembly line? The, the Cherry Garcia? The Cherry Garcia or the, the cone? Yeah, the cone. They, 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 the Grateful Dead are known for Ben and Jerry's, correct? Yeah, that's how they started, exactly. Yeah, they all worked in the factory together. And they decided <laughs> <laughs> that the wages weren't very good, so they started a rock and roll band and become famous. So, them and awesome. the elves. Some of the other elves. So, um, tell us, uh, tell the viewers here that are obviously here to watch you talk about and um, get some information about the Grateful Dead. What does what what made you decide to write this book? Um, um, all the years combined, uh, the Grateful Dead and fifty shows. Well, I, I last year I published a novel called uh, what's it called? A Stage Large and Small, which has a narrator who is kind of into the dead. He was a used bookseller in Toronto, kind of going out of business and kind of a midlife crisis thing, smokes a little too much pot, listens to too much dead. And so it was, I was kind of immersed in it because I myself sort of discovered, well, Garcia's guitar really before the dead uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and then when I finished the book, I still felt like I had things that were going on in my head. And I think that's what writers or musicians do. You kind of get this like little ear where you can't get it out of your head so you have to like write a song or perform it i think it's the same thing for a book i just was boring the hell out of my friends talking about the grateful dead so, oh listen to this part where this happens in this so i thought okay well and then uh, it was the COVID. it was lockdown so uh, every night i would go back to my shack go back and put my head songs on have my notebook and listen to about a billion shows and um and what was fun about it was you know in the abstract i thought really who wants to read 50 you know shows but there was a story too. I guess the novelist in me sort of took over. There's actually a story, you know, not just the rise mm -hmm. and fall of the music, but what success means when you become so big that it's no longer fun anymore, you know, which is the goal. Everyone wants to get big and have big, big shows. And, and when that happened, I think not only the quality of the music declined, but I think the happiness of the, the band members. So that was interesting to me, you know. Um, so it's it, so I wanted to write about. The music too. That was the other thing. It's a good question because I didn't. I think there's so, too much about the Grateful Dead about Jerry Garcia bottleheads and T-shirts and you know it's, it's been assumed by mainstream culture. But originally, it was about a, a kind of music we were kind of talking off air. They're not really like other bands, even musically. They're not even really technically a rock and roll band. You know, they don't they don't play on the one. They're no four four. Mm -hmm. it, it's it kind of just floats there and it's very interesting. And I just felt like. I'd love to take a. I'd love to talk about the dead, not in terms of this happened, this happened, this happened, but in terms of this is what the music was like in '66, this is in '68, this is how it changes, this is how the the culture affects the music a bit, you know, them getting bigger, playing bigger places, and all sorts of things like that. So I kind of had to write the Grateful Dead out of my system, I guess. So that's what I did with all the years combined. Yeah, it's. I I got a chance to start it. I'm about to, uh, maybe a fifth through, but one thing I noticed, um, and like I said. I didn't really grow up um, following them, but I knew that they had a following, so there must have been a reason why. So what what do you think came first, the music or the drugs? What was more important? Because you do um, reference in the book, um, in my opinion anyways, that they were not really musically inclined at the beginning anyways. Musically inclined, but they weren't musically adept. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, Garcia, he, you know, a little bit of rock and roll like everybody in the late 50s, but he gravitated toward folk and then bluegrass. He became a serious bluegrass banjo enthusiast, like really knows his stuff. Um, so when he picks up an electric guitar in 65 or 60, late 65, he's held one before, but he's never really, you know, been the guy. Phil Lesh, the bass player, never played bass. He was a classical guy, jazz guy. Garcia said, hey, we get along really well. 
you should be the bass player. We'll kick the bass player up. Uh, Bob Weir, their first band was a jug band. Bob Weir played the jug. He was one of Garcia's guitar students. So it really was a bunch of friends first before it was, let's find a hot shot bass player. It's like, no, we're all friends. We all get along. We all kind of like, and it's a very interesting time in American music. You know, you've got folk, and country, blues, and rock, and psychedelia, and jazz. And so the, all this whole thing. But I think the drugs are an important part of it because um, drugs for them initially were tools for exploration. They were tools for opening things up, not for, I'll take a pill so I won't feel depressed or I'll have a I'll get drunk. No, it was about, I want more. And I think that really goes hand in hand with the birth of the music, you know, 66, 67, 68, because you hear the music change. The first show in the book, one you probably read, the one that was their first international gig, which is in Vancouver, mm -hmm. actually. They're like a Stonesy 65 R&B kind of cover band, you know, pig pens out front, belt note, a lot of cover songs, a lot of crappy, you know, pseudo psychedelic tunes, but they're really a blues cover band and you can hear them change. And I think the drugs are a part of that because it says, hey, why do we have to stop between songs? Let's just play for an hour. Let's, 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 yeah. let's, let's, let's put four songs together. Jazz people do it. Why can't we do it? Um, and I think that's that, that's really, when you, so when you say drugs, you're not talking about stimulants. You're talking about you know, more, more uh, psychedelic drugs. Right. And, and I think that has a lot to do with it. And I think the pioneering spirit of the dead is very commensurate with that. The music, everything about it is being open which I really find refreshing, very antithetical to our contemporary culture. You have to be on point. I have to be this or that, left or right on this side. The dead are sort of like, this is all a mystery. Let's just try to survive it with some dignity and have some fun. You know, and I found that really inspiring, not just the music, but the story. And the story is in the book, too. I couldn't help but not tell a little bit. But it's not a biography. It's a biography of the music, really. Right. And so speaking of Jerry Garcia, he's the he's probably the most prominent name people know for, uh, about the Grateful Dead. Uh, would you say he was the, obviously the band leader? And is that why um, after his passing, and I think it was 95, that the band really broke up and they had some spinoff bands? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he, he would resist the title of leader. He probably is right. But I think he was the band's conscience. You know, I make a point in the book that they and they weren't hippies; they were neo beatniks. And and Garcia, you know, states in many interviews that his life was saved by discovering the beatnik writers Kerouac and, and all that stuff. And I think when 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 he was healthy and in charge, not in charge, but sort of the conscience of the band, um, I think that was a big part of it. In terms of the post Jerry Garcia dead related music, um, I kind of uh, feel like. Uh, Bill Kritzman, the drummer, said, he said, the Grateful Dead without Jerry Garcia is like the Miles Davis Quintet without Miles Davis. It's still a pretty good band. It's still mm -hmm. wonderful people and wonderful. But you're missing that genius. Uh, because initially, for me, it wasn't like, oh, wow, I want to get into Dead. I heard Garcia's guitar um, in, in, in a solo band recording, a little, a little club playing playing funk and, and some jazzy stuff with a guy named Merle Sanders in 1971. And I had never really been interested in guitar solos. Guitar solos... You know, I grew up in Chatham, so uh, all my radio was Detroit radio. And just a lot of, like, hand-fisted, really, like, empty solos. Like, virtuosic, but just, so what? You know, I want to get back to the song. With Garcia, I kind of heard for the first time what people talk about when they talk about listening to Coltrane or Dwayne Allman or some other, you know, a tour. It, it, it felt like he was speaking in paragraphs and he was he had it was very rich. I, could, I couldn't get enough of it. And I felt like I got to hear every note this guy played. And that, of course, led me into The Dead, which is a whole different ballgame from a solo stuff. It's a different kind of show. And I kind of fell for all that. And then I got into Lesh's bass playing and Weir's very innovative rhythm guitar playing and, and all the great songs. Uh, but for me initially, yeah, it definitely was Garcia. Um, and it still is. It still is. Whenever I get lost in the music, I just say, remember listening to Garcia's guitar. It'll kind of carry you through. So. Yeah. So, so a question maybe you haven't got asked. I'm not sure. Um, what what did Jerry Garcia do for a living before he got into music? Do you have any kind of a history um, of him? Yeah. Um, well, in number, his... he, he did what all good artists do. He tried to avoid having a job, but it wasn't always possible. <laughs> so he taught guitar. That's actually um, he taught Weir guitar. He taught guitar lessons. Um, oh wow! Yeah, and Weir said one of the big moments in his life was he had a buddy where they were too young to get into bars, and they were walking around the back streets of San Francisco on New Year's Eve, and they heard this banjo playing, which is weird because everything was shut down. And they went in, and it was Garcia, who they kind of knew. He was kind of a local legend. He's probably like 20, and Weir's like 15 or 16. And he's like, what's going on, Jerry? Well, I'm waiting for my students. And they're like, well, your students aren't coming. 
And that was really how it happened. He said, well, I got the store, pick up some instruments, and, and, and we'll hang around. So he caught guitar. But, you know, he talked about sleeping in his car, you know, doing all the same things that, you know, whether it be Kurt Cobain or whatever. It was like, how can I avoid having a job? Because I want to play guitar all the time. Well, people who are good at what they do tend to be a little unhealthy about it, a little obsessive. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of goes, you know, an athlete, whatever, right? You, what kind of normal person would, you know, throw a ball eight hours a day? Well, someone who's going to be a really good pitcher or practice the guitar for seven hours a day, right? So I think that's what it has. So he actually, for most of his life, he's a very humble guy, very centered guy in many ways. And he often said, even into the 80s, like, wow, what a score it is. I don't have to work, but I get paid to do this. Right. You know, rock star Malay is like, oh, you know, our record's dying. It's like, I can't believe that, I, that we have, he, I, I genuinely think that he was astounded that he was able to, like, have a career as opposed to a vocation. You know, you got to have the vocation first. You know, it's like a religious commitment. But yeah. you had to actually, you know, pay your bills and have kids. And wow, amazing. And I think that's really healthy. I think there's too much self feeding in the artistic community. You know, it's like no one, no one made us do this. You know, we chose to do this because it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. And I, and I, I think that's really an, another kind of lesson from the Grateful Dead archive. This, this is, this is really special and we should be really appreciative of it, you know? Yeah. It shows their determination. So, yeah. um, Describe the book. Um, basically, I, well, from what I understand, they're the only, they're one of the only bands, anyways, or maybe they um, pioneered it. Um, recorded all their shows, right? And so yeah. the book basically is um, describes the first fifty shows, or just fifty? No, uh, it's not the fifty best shows. Although there was a big headline the other day, <laughs> greatest Grateful Dead show. No, that's not what it is. It's telling the story of the Grateful Dead. They, they probably I think they played like twenty five hundred shows or something. So I've taken 50 as a composite of the journey, sort of like the narrative. Again, using that novelist or storyteller deal. Um, yeah, there are a lot of famous shows, and there are some shows that a lot of deadheads say, oh, that's a important show. But for me, I wanted to, again, show them begin as this rudimentary R&B cover band, sort of growing, the music changing, becoming more psychedelic, more jazz-oriented, and then sort of changing again with time and all the things that go with the decline so it isn't 50 greatest shows but it's 50 shows that i think will take you from the beginning to the end actually the last show in the book is the last show at soldier field in in chicago in july of 1995 uh but a month before garcia died so we, we begin in sanford or in uh, vancouver in 66 which is actually eight months before they had their first record contract right to the last show so obviously i couldn't do every show you know there's different eras are represented by more shows than others but I really want to tell the story of the Dead's music. Now, that said, you still have to tell the story of the people, too. So it's not a biography. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, you know, it's, it's important to know that Lash didn't play the bass before or that Garcia was struggling with, you know, powders and things he shouldn't have been at a certain point. And so those things are important. But the fact they tried to create their own record label, that's important. That's in the book, too. Okay. Uh, they failed, but they tried. They tried. How can, you know, when they were in their early 30s, Garcia would have been 32. They thought, well... The world's changing. Rock and roll is becoming this big entertainment industry. And how can we survive? Because we still want to have fun, but we also want to be grown-ups. And they, they tried. They really tried hard. They tried to make their own record label. They had a spinoff label for solo projects. They tried to sell tickets directly to their own fans. So these ideas were, were, were there. They were one of the first ones to do that. Now, none of them worked out because beatniks probably shouldn't run businesses but um, <laughs> but it's, it's a wonderful idea and again quite inspirational for me, especially in a world that is so monopolized and homogenous everything's big i mean to go to a show now is like going to like you know it's just some big thing it, you know the, the epigraph uh is from a uh, before the shows before i get to the show section of the book and you probably saw it is from bob weir a show on february yeah. 13th 1970 and he says just before we're getting started you know this ain't a this ain't a concert it's a party you know, and I like that idea. I like the idea that it's not I go somewhere and these big important people entertain me for two hours. No, it's like you come in, we'll come out. This is what we're up to. How do you? Feel? And it's this symbiosis and interaction. And I think we're deadly in need of that in our world. And I, I find there's a lot of there's a lot of real realness in the Dead's music. A lot of mistakes. A lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like if they made a mistake, if something what there's a, there's one of the show you haven't gotten there yet. I guess there's a show. They also built their own sound system. Um, when they started playing bigger places, which is just remarkable. It's like, we can make wow. more money. We'll take the money we're making, we'll put it into a sound system. So at a time when the band were making about $300, which would be about $700 a week now, and they were spending about $2 million to build this system. But they ended up using only for 38 shows because it turned out that it cost more money to haul around and pay everybody to do it. Yeah. 
they tried to do it. And I find those things quite, quite inspiring and, and quite reassuring that there are people who really care about the, the real, the good stuff, the quality, the, the interaction between other people and themselves, you know? Um, so, yeah. Um, next question is kind of a three parter, I guess. Um, everybody knows uh, the, the, the phrase that a dad had, um, how many shows have you been to? And what was the other question? That was the second part of that. Um, it, it, the shows are more like a Woodstock on uh, on wheels, right? I mean, every yeah. every show is like a, a, a big festival almost. Yeah. And, and actually, I've never been to a dead show. I got, okay. in, the dead. I got in the dead uh, like 2013 or so. So Garcia had been long, long gone. Now, since then, I've met a lot of people, been to a lot of shows. And actually, I talk about this at the end of the book when I talk about, for example, a show from 1986. Um, I don't feel that the music is, stands up to the earlier, but one of the things I think was lacking in the earlier draft and is in there now, my editor pointed this out, um, was that a lot of people, for exactly what you just said, it, yeah, the music, sure, but it was about the scene. It was about uh, what's called Shakedown Street, the, 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 the carnival that takes place outside. Um, the sense of inclusiveness, like no matter what, who you are, look like you're, you're ahead, come on in kind of deal. Um, it was a very different ethos than going to see ACDC or something, right? There were no fists in the air pointing, you know, which is great. It's a different kind of scene. It's, it's high energy. No, this is more. And, and so that, that's a really important part of it. I think what's happened, though, is that that's kind of overshadowed the most important thing, which is the music. And to me, the music, say, 1974, when they, they kind of retired for 18 months, there's really nothing else like it in American music. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to re redress. Um, that said, you know, there are, uh, the, the launch here in Toronto on December 9th, we've got a wonderful um, Grateful Dead tribute band called Whose Cat is Dead. We're just, just huh? smoking. They're great. And it's a wonderful time because it's that same kind of feeling. And it's almost a little bit like church. You know, you're there. They're recreating the sounds of of this music. And there's a lot of love and a lot of appreciation. And... Uh, so I'm, I'm all for that. But I, this book really is about, let's talk about, this is me with headphones on. Because, you know, everyone I talk to says, oh, you've never been to a dead show. You know, anybody who's ever been to a dead show is going to be gone in 25 years, 30 years. You know, none of us are going to be left. <laughs> what's going to be left is the music. Yeah. And what's going to be left is the music. And not, not your concert memories. You know, I met my girlfriend in 94. I'm no, that's all great. Good stuff. But what's going to be left is the same thing we have when we listen to Billie Holiday or Miles Davis or Jimmy Rogers is just that music. And I still, and I think that's what the recording legacy is going to be. Um, and as you pointed out too, they recorded all of their shows from the beginning, which was a really unorthodox decision. Mm -hmm. It was their sound engineer, Owsley, the uh, the legendary acid manufacturer. He was their sound sort of sponsor, and he only did it for utilitarian reasons. He did it because he wanted to hear how his shows sounded. And then when the band found out, because they were young and full of energy back then, they would say, let's bring the show back to somebody's hotel room afterward and listen to the show and see how it could be different. So they kind of did it for those reasons. And after a while, it just became habit. And then lo and behold, this whole thing, classic rock began or whatever. And, well, we got a pension fund now. We got all these great shows. So you have the Dave's picks and Dick's picks and and uh, and all of that. So it's become, and so now bands are scrambling and sort of, we got to record our shows. But initially it was done, again, very dead like just so that the band could hear it and maybe put on a better show. We could sound better. We could be better that way. It wasn't done for financial reasons, but it's had this great late boom, you know, for everybody. Yeah. Right on. Um, so um, we talked a, a few a few minutes before we started to record, and um, what I did was I Googled, um, you know, kind of Grateful Dead backgrounds, and this came up. So explain what does this mean? Well, I, everybody loves a rainbow, so I'm sure that's okay. But there's so bears, the bears, I think. The bears, the bears come back to who I was just talking about. Uh, Owsley, his nickname was Bear. And um, he heard them in 65. Now, Owsley, of course, is famous. He created the Purple Haze Acid that Jimi Hendrix wrote about, Blue Cheer. All those are all Owsley's band. He probably gave away about a million dollars worth of that. A million dollars worth in 1967 or so. He's very wow. evangelical about it. He also loved the dead and he thought their sounds he was also electronics wizard so he uh, he was their first uh, sound guy and okay. so the, the the bear has become a kind of a, a kind of a gentle little dead thing to put up there to sort of say it's yeah it's just a bear but it really is also the dead so yeah so if you see the bears think acid so oh, okay i think i think <laughs> i think i've seen that reference on the simpsons when they did kind of a psychedelic 
yeah. um, episode. Yeah. Exactly. What What would you say your favorite songs by the Dead are? Well, what's interesting is, uh, and writing this book was that I, I'm definitely I've gone on and stated that my favorite period in terms of like Desert Island is '71 to '74. But then when I'm writing the book, I realize, oh, geez, there's so many great things from '77 and '78. So it's more like different periods, you know, like early on in 1970, those two great kind of, I guess you'd call them country rock Americana albums. Mm -hmm. There's just so many great songs, Casey Jones and Truckin' and Ripple and Cumberland Blues. And then the the writing changes, becomes a little more open-ended or a little more opaque, you know, China Doll and Stella Blue. That's actually where the title comes from, all the years combined, because it's a song called China Doll. Um, and then later on, Terrapin Station, 77 and 70, all that stuff. But probably, it probably comes down to Dark Star. Dark Star is probably the ultimate Grateful Dead tune. Yeah. It's, it's a 30-minute song that has a little bit of a, uh, a a few little guitar chords at the beginning, and then it's whatever we feel like that night, which means that all of them are different. You know, Some nights they're real scronky and real angry. Other times they're more gentle and reflective. Other times they're more playful. And again, that goes back to what I'm saying. Like a dead show is like we have to perform Dark Star exactly like it's supposed to be on the album. There is no version, and that's part of the deal. I love the fact. I think it was Tom Constantine or maybe it was Lesh said somewhere that Dark Star is always playing. Just once in a while, we are assembled to sort of channel it through. <laughs> um, like a jam also, session. Yeah, yeah. And so and another song called "The Other One." Uh, they would alternate, say seventy. One or 72, 74, they would alternate other. And these, these are real, real explorations. These are deep space. And sometimes they're, there's not a lot going on. Sometimes it's a little bit of <laughs> a little wankery, you know, but that's because they're traveling without a map, you know. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the shows in the book, you haven't gotten there yet, but 73 at the Nassau Coliseum, uh, they're playing that song, the other one, which in 73 is usually a 20, 25 minute song. And they're about seven minutes in, and it's real kind of spacey and dark. And then Garcia, apropos nothing else, starts, he chums the opening chords to this new song, which is kind of a samba-esque called Eyes of the World. And let's do that now instead. And the analogy I give is like, can you imagine if like the Stones were playing Satisfaction and the key said, oh, that's, that's boy, let's play this new song instead. It's like, <laughs> no, it's a show. People paid to come see this. we got to entertain them. And, and the dad's idea for very long, for a long period of time was, no, we're not entertaining you. We're entertaining ourselves, and hopefully you will get off and we get off, and hopefully right. we'll try this thing together. And I just find that incredibly, not courageous, but just, you know, just so suffused with integrity. And the spirit of this, it's supposed to be fun for everybody. You're not supposed to perform. You know, I think it eventually did come that. It became a job, but that's a different part of the book. Right. But 73, I just, I remember listening to that show for the first time and going, okay, whoa, what, what, what's this? Just, just didn't feel like it. Got a new song I'd like you to hear. You know, I just find that so refreshing, you know. Out of the blue, yeah. Yeah, yeah that is courageous and refreshing. These yeah. days, I don't know if many sponsors would allow them to right. do that. Right, exactly. You promised to play the four hits. And... Yeah, this is in the contract. Exactly, exactly, right, exactly. And actually, the dead, after a certain point, because of course they're legendary for their three and four, some nice five-hour shows. I, there's, I've got a, a book that has a few of the contracts, and the contracts, do, the dead may play for as long as they want, up to six hours, you are not allowed. Wow. Done, and they would just unplug them, you know, like a bunch of freaking hippies. Just unplug it. It's like, no, no, it's in the contract. We can play for as long as we want. Which yeah, is, I mean, like, people sponsors would be scrambling for a band that would play that long. I didn't try. It wouldn't be hard to sell a show like that. Though they're going to probably play for a half a day. So right. get your tickets I just, now. I did the uh, I did the liner notes for a very, completely unrelated to this book to a Grateful Dead box set that came out this year called uh, Here Comes Sunshine. It's five shows from 1973. And I think one of them's three and a half, the other three, the other three of them are four, and the other one's close to five hours. Um, mm-hmm. Now, again, different kinds of drugs by that point. They're using a lot of coke. Um, and it's disingenuous to say, you know, it's true that that did ruin a lot of people's lives, including some people in the dead's world. But at the same time, in 1973, it kind of was working. You know, you're not playing five-hour shows just drinking Coca-Cola, right? You, you, and they're yeah. young, so that helps. They're young. That's good. Yeah, uh, but young and on drugs—that's a good combination if you, if you can if you can make it work, you know. And that's the beauty of art. On that yeah. CD that I have, that four CD set, it worked. Now I didn't have to go home with Jerry Garcia with him bouncing off the walls and you know rattling his wife and all that stuff. But in terms of the art, that's the interesting thing in the book too. You know, I'm not one of these like yes or no people. It's always 
contextual. And there's, there's always a touch of gray in everything. Yeah, time. there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's a touch of ambiguity, <laughs> right? Um, did they ever make it up to Canada? I know I should have looked this up, but oh yeah. Well, the the, the first show of the book is from Vancouver, six. Yeah, Saturday. Vancouver. That's right. I remember seeing that. But, but but no, really, really not a lot. They also they played Vancouver in '73. A couple, I think twice. Pretty sure twice. They're great shows. Uh, they came back in '77 and they played at near Seneca College in Toronto. Yeah. But they didn't return for 13 years because. This is very Canadian. The uh, the border official said these boys might have drugs. Yeah, they, would... they, they, they 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 searched. Uh, they gave uh, Garcia a cavity search, and oh. they said we're not coming back to Canada ever again. So they did come back to Hamilton for a couple of shows, or maybe two or three shows in nineteen ninety. But by then, you know, they were big rock stars, so it wasn't a big deal. But yeah, he didn't he didn't really enjoy that. And I actually have that show, and I'm listening to it sometimes, thinking. Geez, you know, five hours before he was bent over a counter. Yeah, he <laughs> probably sounds a bit hollow. <laughs> yeah, like, how can this guy be so professional? You know, but yeah. uh, but no, not, not not a lot aside from that. Yeah, right on. Uh, before I let you go, uh, where can uh, people get the book? Well, it's just it pubs November seventh. I don't know when this airs, but it, it seems like it's already out. I've been getting some emails from people, some nice emails, but it's already out. And I think you know Amazon's pre-ordering and stuff. Uh, where where are you based at? Are you in um, right on the border with uh, Michigan, Sioux, Ontario? Oh, okay. Because uh, yeah. Windsor, the book my publisher is in Windsor, and their their bookshop is the Bibli Oasis bookshop. They of course have the stock, but yeah, most bookstores have it, and I think Amazon's got it. It seems to be doing okay. So nice change for me, you know. <laughs> right on. Well, thanks again, Ray. Uh, what's the opposite of unsubscribe? Unsubscribe. <laughs> Subscribe, I guess. Everybody do as Ray Robertson, a uh, great author, says to subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. Uh, and once again, thanks uh, for your time, Ray. Thanks. I appreciate it, man. Talk to you later.